So I'd like to introduce our speakers this afternoon, two highly successful experts in the professional sports environment who will share their experiences and knowledge with you on their coaching thoughts and perspectives. We are very honored to have both Adam and Trevor here this afternoon, so I'd like to first introduce to you Adam Simpson, the senior coach for the West Coast Eagles. Adam Simpson is a West Coast sixth coach and joins the club having come from successful environments as a player and an assistant coach. He is also a member of one of the AFL's most exclusive clubs, the 300 Club. Having played 306 games with North Melbourne, yielding two premierships, he was also the best and fairest, an All-Australian and captain for five seasons. After a four-year assistant coaching apprenticeship with Hawthorne under Alastair Clarkson, Simpson joined the Eagles ahead of the 2014 AFL season. Ironically, the club he made his debut against whilst playing was North Melbourne. After narrowly missing the finals in his first season at the helm, Simpson led the Eagles to a grand final appearance in 2015 in just his second season as a senior coach for the Eagles, and then to the finals in each season since, as the Eagles again set their sights for September of 2018. As a coach, Simpson is an avid sports enthusiast and passionate ambassador for the role education plays in developing people. Impressive. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Trevor Gleason, head coach of the Perth Wildcats. Trevor Gleason is the most successful coach in the Perth Wildcats storied history. After joining the club in 2013, he's led this team to five consecutive postseasons and winning three NBL championships in 2014, 16, and 17, and finishing semifinalists in the other two seasons. Despite the Wildcats having won eight titles in its 36 years, Trevor Gleason is the only Perth Wildcats coach in its history to win multiple championships. While coaching Townsville in 2011, Gleason was named the NBL Coach of the Year, and Gleason was an assistant coach for the Australian Boomers at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games. He spent time as an AFL skills coach at North Melbourne and Hawthorne, which surely will come up in the future considering this cross comparison. So with that, I'm just going to move and we're going to start the event. Well, it's great to sit with both of you. Um, impressive. And then I read that. So that was <laughs> quite good. <laughs> yeah. So before we get started, I'll, I'll start with you, Adam. I just, both of you, I'll ask you just to give you, give our um, crew here a bit of a background to how you got to where you are in your coaching. Yeah, well, mine's pretty short, really, because uh, I think um, reflecting on my playing career is, is one part of my life. That was the, the long part. That was a uh, that was 15 or 16 years at, at North Melbourne and um, very fortunate to be a, a really good club at the time and we had some success, won a couple of premierships and uh, I was 33 when I retired and I reckon when I was about 28 I thought, geez, I'm going to need a job when I finish football and I had a passion for, for teaching, um, I had a, a real unique opportunity to help with our midfield group at North Melbourne, we didn't have a lot of money at the time and not many coaches so I got the opportunity to coach a little bit while I was playing and I, um, I really tried to invest a bit of time into that my last four or five years as a player so that got me a foot in the door to be an assistant coach and a lot of players in AFL finish playing and just think they can be a coach and walk straight into it but I was a little bit more prepared so that got me a job at uh, Hawthorne under Alistair Clarkson and very fortunate there as well that uh, I hit I hit the, hit the club at 2010 and uh, I left Hawthorne at 2013 and I won the premiership um, against Fremantle. So short coaching career really, it was four years and then I, I got a phone call from, from West Coast and went for the job and uh, I, I don't know how but I got it and uh, um, yeah and I've been, this is my fifth year as a, as a senior coach so yeah I'm, I'm probably, my career doesn't uh, span or is, is decorated as the man next to me, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a start point at the moment. Definitely. Thank you for that. And Trevor? Yeah, I guess mine was a, a little bit different. That uh, I played sport at a junior, came from uh, country Victoria, a small town uh, called Warnable, about 25,000 population, and very competitive, competitive older brothers, and uh, played football, basketball, and 18, I had an accident, and I couldn't play sport 
uh, any longer. I played in a couple of Australian championships for basketball and it was really at that stage what I was going to do. I, I loved sport, any, anything that had a ball involved I was there and to stay involved with the sport I thought I wanted to get involved with coaching and I started coaching kids under 10s, under 12s and as the years went over um, I coached a little bit higher, coached women uh, in the state league competition and then I moved over to the men, I think I was 22 or 23 coaching in the state league competition in Warrnambool and, uh, and then it just kind of evolved, I, I uh, got a very lucky break with Brisbane Bullets uh, Brian Curl, he's a, like a basketball legend, he's won four championships in his time, he hired me actually I went for an interview for another job that a good friend of mine here got uh, but then the next day they rang me up and said, hey, listen, we want to hire you as a development coach. And I said, you beauty, um, full time. And it was only paying $18,000, but I knew if I did a good job and get an experience, I'd get an opportunity later on. So I really took that to learn how to be a professional coach. And I was there for three years. Uh, we had a guy that owned a team called Eddie Groves that uh, some people might be familiar with at ABC. Uh, child care centres, he, he came in when there was a big, uh, big conflict between the coach and our best player tried to get his right hand man and get a new contract and that uh, made the team lose a lot of games so we missed the playoffs. Usually happens you miss the playoffs you get fired so I got fired, uh, <laughs> just a part of the furniture and I really tried to get a job somewhere in Australia coaching basketball and I tried, I couldn't and then I rang up uh, um, a friend of mine, he said, well, why don't you go to America? So off to, I went to America, I didn't know anybody, got to uh, LAX, went straight to a hostel and found some coaching clinics and I just started to outwork some people over there. And if you know Americans, and I can say this because my wife's an American, they're uh, good at telling you how good they are and they talk often, but they're usually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad she's not here to do it. But, um, so I got an opportunity and just one thing led to another. I stayed four years in, in America coaching. After that, an opportunity came to South Korea. Um, then it was a decision either go back to America or come to Australia and there was a job open in Townsville and stars are aligned for me uh, so far and, and uh, the last five years, coming up six years now, I've been in beautiful Perth and hopefully be here for a long time. Great, great story. Yeah. I'll get you back. I'll get you back, Trevor, about that American comment. In a little bit. <laughs> but um, we'll save that for a surprise. Mm, shucks. Um, but with that said, um, a lot of the questions that came in, um, Joe Lyons actually um, sent in quite a few questions, very detailed questions. She may be going for an assistant position as a defensive coordinator for somebody. So okay. just letting you know. But in general, the reflection was: What have either of you learned from each other? or cross sports, and being coaches, you're a fan of sport collectively. How do you draw and compare and contrast from other sports in order to improve the coaching in your current sport? Well, I suppose for, for me, uh, a lot of my reflections are from when I was growing up, and I played a lot of basketball when I was, when I was a kid, and I think the top end players, is, and you would know this as well, there's their connection. Now, I'm not sure if it's as strong with basketball into AFL, but definitely the the top line AFL players uh, often are very good at basketball, and I, I think you know if I had a, uh, a father who's coaching uh, his kids uh, plays in my son's team under tens, and he said, "What do I need to do to get my son to the next level?" And I said, "Get him to go play basketball." So I think there's a massive connection with peripheral vision and uh, and obviously touch. So these boys do it better than us in terms of uh, the 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 skills that, that required to have the quick reflexes. We train a lot of things, but when we get kids in that have got basketball background, they're sharper. So that, for me, already is a connection worth exploring. So we've connected a little bit over the journey. I, um, we spoke to each other at, uh, at Hawthorne. I'll let you talk about your experiences there, but we train once a week pre-season at the basketball courts, and we'll always start with some, some touch with, with the basketballs. So. Uh, the connection is definitely there uh, on, in terms of reflexes and, and your peripheral vision. So we play a bit of five on five. Our boys don't play it too well. It's not quite uh, as graceful as what you see on TV. But the, um, the fact is there's connection. And that's one element, I suppose, of our sport that we can connect. I mean, the other part in terms of coaching is, is broader. It's you know, how you treat your players, your culture, 
what kind of spirit you're trying to deliver, um, education, all those things, how you look at vision. I dare say we're doing the same things most weeks, mate. Uh, yeah. that's, that's connected. I'll, what have you got to say about your uh, well, the experience at Hawthorne, I suppose, is when we first met? Yeah, it, uh, I was off for a year. That's a nice way of saying I got fired. We didn't make the playoff. <laughs> So I, was, um, I got to work with North Melbourne for, uh, for six months or so and, and then the next year I went with uh, Hawthorne. They just brought me on uh, to do some ball skids just to use their imagination and I really came in there for 10 sessions or that's all I was hired to do for 10 sessions and then the players really liked what we were doing. It was competitive and they were getting use out of it and it was really putting... Um, and that, that goes back to a few years ago, we were, we were in Townsville and we couldn't recruit the big name players when we were in Townsville. It was, they were going to Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane back then. And it was like, well, what can we control? And it was like, well, we can control. We want to be the best ball skill team in the NBL. So we came up with some dynamic drills and it was virtually those drills that we came up with. The next year, all of a sudden, we were better at it, we were less turnovers, our shooting percentage got better for some unknown reason and we virtually kept the same team and we went from fifth to third. So there was some real value in doing that and so while I was off, I was seeing AFL and I said, well, you know, you guys do like a warm-up pass and, but, you know, you're not making split decision decisions, you're not picking up loose ball, you're fumbling it. So I kind of packaged that thing together with, for, uh, for Hawthorne and the guys really, really enjoyed it. And, and then I finished up staying there for six months until I got um, uh, the gig over here with the Perth Wildcats. We, we actually had, I was at Hawthorne, I was an assistant coach and uh, I was trying to connect basketball as well. So I put a basketball ring in the warm-up area and I was trying to teach our ruckman how to box out and no one does it better than, than you know, these guys. So we just used to have foul shots and just work on how to box out for a rebound. I think that really connects to ruck work. So when you, when you come along out, we've got four or five players. The best four or five players at Hawthorne are the best four or five basketballers. Um, I think, you know, Rough Edwards well, is quite good. Yeah. Actually, Buddy, Buddy's terrible. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's only good at footy, which yeah, is all right. Yeah, but the, uh, right. the other boys, in particular midfield, Sam Mitchell and Luke yeah. Hodge and yeah. Jordan Lewis and Rough Head, uh, not only were they uh, good one-touch basketballers, but they played like their lives depended on it in the, uh, in the touch session. So there was definite connection. Mm -hmm. Now, both of you, as you did that, you kind of reflected on things, and then you made up your own, uh, say, process and then a solution to it, mm -hmm. which goes into the coaching process, like how you change over time. Do either of you want to comment how your coaching's changed over time, and is it a function of your environment, your observations, your wins, your losses? Like yeah, a combination of everything. It's I was I was really an angry coach when I first started. It was. Are you still pretty angry? <laughs> I'm I've calm seen, now. I've seen you on the bench. <laughs> I just look at you when I go and watch games. Yeah. <laughs> well, I often thought, imagine the AFL. You know, they're up in their box, and you see that they muted. Or imagine if they're right next to the umpire, right there, like we are on a basketball oh, court. There'd be, be there'd awesome. be strife right there. But um, yeah, I think. Uh, I've got a, a lot mellower in my approach, and there's, there's a, you know, it's not a great saying, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. And, um, and that's where I, I probably use some resources and um, some mentors or some uh, people that I know, and I'll ring them up and get their perspective. And that's, that's been um, fantastic for my development. In the early years, it was my way or the highway, if you're not doing that, get out of here. Now I don't care whose idea it is, as long as it's helping us get better. And it's often now I'm in a stage probably a little bit comfortable with myself coaching that I don't have to keep on proving myself um, on the floor. Now, and it also helps you, you have the, one of the best defensive players in the history of the NBL. I'll just go to Damo, how do you want to defend that? And they'll talk about it, the players will, will talk about it. And I'll say, okay, you, are you happy with doing that? And so, We'll do it, but if they screw up, I've got them. And so, <laughs> so a little bit more open-minded uh, as I get a little bit older. I'm a little bit different. I, I, this is my fifth year of, of coaching my own side, so I, 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 um, I, I think of your pathway and think how much more better prepared I would have been, um, which is different at AFL level. So mine has gone from a little bit of um, what I thought would work 
wasn't exactly the, the best way to do it, but I knew that wasn't going to be the best way. I was, I was pretty raw. So I just tried to be myself and uh, I used my playing career as a start point. What did I like? Uh, Alistair and Hawthorne teach you a lot about how to educate your players and everything on reflection that you want our players to do. For us, we want it to be instinctive. So having all these strategies for us, we can't call a timeout, we can't give instructions other than a runner who gets it wrong half the time. <laughs> That's not, that's, that's not funny. Uh, <laughs> that happens. That happens a lot. But we, the better we are getting as a side, the more the players are making the decisions. And my job is to teach instinct uh, for, for that decision making, not only with the ball, but, OK, on the weekend, we, we had a really good win right on, on the siren. Now, what, that build up, the last two minutes, I got to send one message. And that one message was, there's 40 seconds to go. And um, they thought it was four minutes. And so, didn't get that one right either, but the, <laughs> what we did do at three-quarter time is we said, if this happens or this happens or this happens, I want you to do this, this and this, and, and sure enough, what we thought would happen did happen. So I suppose that was coaching, but holistically, I'm, I'm evolving a lot quicker um, because I think I'm so young in the caper, and uh, the biggest thing we've done in the last 12 months is strip things back, give them more time off, and talk about the love of the game. So they're, they're probably the three things we've done that have got us in a better space. Now, with that, you've been talking, both of you, about um, your coaching, but maybe just to shift over towards the players and some of the players you inherit and some of the players you will directly recruit, could you both talk about what you look for, maybe delimit it down to maybe three characteristics that you really look for in a player? And that can, obviously, it's going to range from their perspectives, psychology, to their actual physical attributes, but if you just want to uh, touch we're, on we're quite different because, uh, okay. uh, you know, we're lucky enough to be um, a successful, uh, financially successful club, and um, every club has a recruiting division, so we'd have 10 full-time recruiters, and, uh, and then you've got every state as well for part-time, so there's probably over 20 all up that scout uh, the under-18s, uh, the under-16s, the pro scouting, which is you know VFL and the lower leagues, and then there's also other players within within the competition. So I get I don't have I'm part of a committee, but I will never override the work that people do. So I'm very fortunate. I've got I've got a lot of trust in in my recruiters, so I don't have to um, do do the hard yards. And I'll be interested to know the, the way that you guys do it. But we we get presented with a draft every year, and we get three or four picks, and we have our order and. We have a philosophy that we get together with, and that's, that's been set a number of years ago. And I stick to that philosophy, and as long as our recruiters get the right talent, she's all good, uh, but we, we, you get it wrong a lot. Uh, but every club does that. So the strike rate for us is OK in the last few years. You're a bit different, though, aren't you? Yeah, we're, we're really hands-on with the, the recruiting. So this year, we've brought five players in, so we've got a roster of 11. So we're, we are... Uh, big time trying to get the right people first and foremost because if you get one bad apple out of 10, that's 10% an issue and normally they infect other people's performance. So we're very big on uh, the culture and the person. Um, we always look for, well I always look for someone that's gone through some adversity and how they've responded. Um, you know, it's more selfless once you go through that, you're not so concerned about yourself. So that's a, we want to tick that box. Obviously, their skill level has to be up there. And it's to being a good guy. It's, you know, it's not being a bad guy. It's just some, go some guys aren't good guys, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, so we try to look for a really good guy. And I will, I'll, we'll sit down with every recruit and have that feeling of, um, you know, uh, you're a good match for us. And, there's, there's one guy, that, especially our imports, and, and we do a lot of research with our imports, and hopefully most of the time we get that right, but there was one guy, super talented, NBA talented, uh, but he bounced around a couple of teams it, from colleges, had some bad raps, and we went out for lunch, and he just, he answered everything perfect, and, uh, and I thought, wow, you know, this, and then about an hour and a half later, I said, hang on, he, he just answered everything too perfect. It was like something was pre-recorded, and he gone through that experience and he used that angle to get out and 
It, after that, it didn't really sit well with me, so we passed on him and we picked up uh, another guy and that would finish up all right with Casey Praith who won two championships with us. But he wasn't as talented as, as um, the first guy. But then a year later, the first guy got in trouble off the court where he broke into a place and he finished up getting shot. Now he's getting NBA money. So if you're still breaking into a place at that stage, um, you know, there was issues. But it was just red flags coming up after I was thinking. But we're very big on the culture. And if you don't fit that culture, I'll take a less talented player every day of the week. We're, yeah. it, uh, unfortunately for us at AFL level, we're drafting, I'm not sure the age profile for you guys, it's mm -hmm. be a bit higher. Yeah, yeah. We're getting 18 year olds, yeah, right. so we're, we're visiting parents and what's the upbringing like and how yeah. they go on in year, year 11 and year 12. And it does make you question whether the age profile needs to, be, to, to, to lift a little. So they do get a bit more life experiences because we get some guys who have never washed their clothes mm -hmm. yep. and uh, don't have I've a license. I've got a couple of those too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, and <laughs> no excuse. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and the restrictions are, the recruiting a, is a very interesting topic because, you know, we're trying to get a lot of our kids from Victoria. So they all go to host families as well. And um, how that's all managed, it's a, the character is very, very important, uh, especially if they come over to the West. Now, this, this question is pretty directed, Trevor, because you do get imports. Mm -hmm. And so, and they may be uh, a high profile import. How do you both, actually, I'll start with you though, do you ever change your offensive or defensive structures because of the personnel you have? Or do you most often try to get the personnel you have to run with a direction that you're trying to take? Yeah, we, we have uh, a, what we call the coaches week. So we go away for like three days and lock ourselves in the rooms, no phones. And we go through everything that um, from traveling to everything that you can imagine, the phones, at training, to the, what, where we want to stay, every, the whole lot. And, and a big part of that is the first part is finding out our strengths of the team. And that's part of the recruiting as well. So when we recruit imports, we want somebody to match. And like I said before, we have Damian Martin is one of the best defensive players that, you know, in the history of the NBL. We want someone to complement him. So we don't want him doing all this work and the other guy's just sitting back and he just passes over. We lose that strength, the strength of ours. And so we'll, we'll get away and we'll, that's our strength. This is our weakness. So we want to highlight this area here as our strength and we want to cover our weaknesses as much as we can. And we'll pick our offense and defense out of that. And we want, right now, we want Bryce Cotton shooting the lot because he gets the ball in. Uh, we've got a big player, from, he's a really good passer in the post, so we want to feed him the ball a lot. And so we want you know, the, our best players getting the ball at the right areas. And we, all, um, we always develop a plan around our strengths of the team. Well, we, do, we, we haven't spoken about this, but we do exactly the same. We, we get away for two days uh, and I allocate different sections of our style of play to our coaches. We're a little bit different in the sense that we, we draft players and we have them, the consistent 18 probably players are there for, they've been there for three or four years now, or five years, so um, we're not changing a list over as much at the top end, but we'll, we evolve every year, so we'll reflect on where we stood in the season before. Um, so at the moment, in 2015, we lost some key position players in our back line, we had two or three knee reconstructions. And we come up with a new way of defending, but that wasn't a plan <laughs> on, that, uh, on that trip. So it was, it was something that we evolved to. But since we did, we've done that, we've taken the game to a different level that we like. And some teams have copied us when we've copied some other teams as well. So we, we evolve a lot in our sport. Uh, so to say I'll pick my uh, or recruit around our game of, our style of uh, play is probably not quite true. We've, we're evolving as we go. So we'll just reflect on what we're poor at and come up with a way that we think will get us better and we'll train that through fundamentals over pre-season. So we're trying to be good at everything, as I'm sure you are as well, but the, the, the fact is, um, yeah, they evolve a bit, little bit more as the season goes. The game looks a lot different than what it did round one for us already, so it's hard to plan that. Yeah. Um, both of you kind of reflected on the psychology of a player and the culture on the team or the ups and downs, injuries can change not just your tactics, but it can kind of change the perspective of the player. There's a lot of pressure in both of your sport, in all sport really. 
What kind of support and what do you do for the psychological we welfare of your athletes? Yeah, oh, well, there's a bit going on at the moment with us. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's watching you're talking about. the papers. <laughs> yeah, I suppose if you just you know honed in on uh, Nat Nui, who, who did his second knee, and um, just the emotion of that at the time was was uh, heartbreaking and. Um, and for, for a week, it's, it's front page, or maybe a bit more, but what's Nick doing right now is my worry. You know, he's, he's been in a brace for, for a few weeks, and he's, he's two months in a brace, and he's watching his teammates play. So his, his mental health is really, really important to us. We're getting more and more recruits because we draft these young kids. Um, any money we get, we put it towards welfare, and, um, you know, the, the mind is, is so interesting at the moment for us as a... As a as a team, we've only introduced mindfulness with our, with our players and meditation. All these things were laughable for AFL players three or four years ago. Now, it's one of the key driving things that we do before we play. So mental health for us is huge. Um, Andrew Gaff's another one at the moment who's going through some issues personally and, and obviously publicly that uh, we're better equipped now. We've got more understanding, but um, I think there's still a long way to go to get that spot on for us. Yeah, it's, um, we're pretty similar, similar to uh, what Adam said. We're um, very big, our culture is very big getting around. The, one, the good thing to see the Eagles this last week was they get around their players and sport. I thought uh, Adam did a great job you know, being around that situation and supporting each other. There was one voice, and so there wasn't different opinions. There was one voice coming from... I think that's very big for a team so that you don't get divisive and splinter. Um, and then I seen the photo the boys took after the game when they sent the gaffy, and I thought that was, that uh, influenced to, to know that if something goes wrong on your watch, your teammates are there to have your back. I think that is so valuable in teams because there's so much, especially social media, and you can just go straight on and they get isolated from the group. And when a player gets isolated from the group and starts thinking individually and without that support, then you get some major issues. But if you know if you're in a culture that you're going to make mistakes, you're going to maybe not mess up as bad, but if you know that someone's got your back and you'll reciprocate that, um, that play, and that's when you know you've got a good team, the synergy's in the team and everyone's putting you in the right direction. So it's, it's a hard one to really nail, but the, it makes or breaks teams when you go through something like Adam's done in the last three months. With that said, the media, both of you commented upon, they, they're a bigger influence now than they ever have been. The, ga the game's changed, but the, the media that we deal with has changed vastly. We, we put a lot of work into how we train up our players on how yep. to handle media. So we've got a whole section of our education, and we educate our players a lot on how to, we do media training. So yep. um, yeah, our coaches do media training. Uh, we use a lot of just our experience as well, but the. The last few weeks has been challenging because uh, when someone challenges your culture, you, that's the one thing that gets you out of your chair. So I've been quite strong on that part and uh, I think our players have been very resilient uh, this season and they're playing with real spirit. So we're as tight as we've been in my time at the club and that's not just the players, it's the whole department and then the whole footy club is just galvanised. It's, it's as tight as I've seen the club. So when someone so throws out that little one-liner, First of all, you know, a question, what, what does culture mean? To, and it means different things to different people. So trying to control that is impossible. All we can do is be honest with who we are and hold our integrity, and um, you can't win. So you just got to be yourself and stay true to your own beliefs. We, we often talk about, and I'm probably showing my age here, um, and then, now I'm, I'm... Actually, I'm coaching one guy last year, this, we went past the phone box, and he, I said, have you ever been in that? He said, no, nah, never used the phone whatsoever. So get in there and ring me up right now. He said, what do I do? So that's the generation coming through. But uh, I got on that because I used to watch Maxwell Smart, Get Smart. So I, I said the cone of silence. You know, the chief and Maxwell put the cone of silence. never worked. But I said, what happens in this room is the code of silence. So this is us. This is the inner sanctum. This is where we can be truthful and honest with each other without... Everything out there, and excuse my French, we could put a shit shield on and let it bounce off. And 
I um, actually when Adam was up, I was watching the TV, they were just, I, I don't know if I could handle that. I would have probably taken the earpiece off and, and finished the interview. But um, that's, that's the kind of mentality that we want. So anything else is, doesn't matter. Anything that happens in this room is this is gospel that we've, we're all in about. And I think that perspective, so when you get those lines from the media, they're not bite so much, that probably I would have. Um, but we also, with, with the training, we don't do so much training with the players, but I, I stole this idea from uh, rugby that they have the smaller groups, um, so they'll break into groups, and one player will have to go up there and present to the rest of the team. So just say they watch five or six video clips in that small group, and they'll pick one out, then they have to come and present to the rest of the team. And a lot of players, you know, get nervous up in front of the team, what are they going to do? But it just gives them exposure and how to uh, handle themselves with the heat on. So it's been really good for us, actually. That's great. So um, you started to touch, it was just a joke, but it's not a joke, the generation change. Mm. And you're coaching now players that are in clearly different generations. How do you approach that to bring them all together under the same banner and you have to motivate them in different ways? Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, because I, I, um, we get the younger ones. Um, when I first started, I tried to get right in their lives, and they don't really want that. <laughs> um, they want to be coached. They want, they, want, they want to be cared about. Um, so I've got a lot of empathy for my players, and that's the one thing I've probably changed more than anything, is when they get within the club and, and within the four walls, I, I, I treat them a lot, a lot differently than I did my first year. It wasn't as, I was probably a little bit too forthright and right between the eyes. It's just, as a player, I just like to be told that wasn't good enough. I can't do that as much now with the next, this generation coming through, and that's okay. It's not good or bad. It's just different. So I don't think they're weaker. It's just that you've got to handle things differently. So, you know, treating every player the same is really dangerous. So um, I, I hope to treat everyone fairly, but I, I can't treat them the same because they're all different. Shannon Hearn, for example, just tell me what's going on. And I can go, mate, that was no good. But, as another player, I, I've, got to, I've got to dance around the conversation for 10 minutes. I'll get to the end point, but I can't, I can't go the same approach. So, yeah, the gen, this current generation's, like I said, it's not worse. It's just a different, different style of teaching. And that's probably might get back to your uh, question before about how did you coach to their strengths or do you coach a certain pattern? And I think back in the 70s, 80s, that was the way it was. That's, that's the way we're doing it, and you've got to do it right now, and you jump as hard as high as I say, and if you want to get court time or on the field, or what, you have to do it. Then the generation come now, it's what's in it for me. You know, and so we only have five guys on the court at any one stage, so I've got six guys off the court, so I have to sell their opportunity. And the same as we're selling right now, because we're in pre-season, we're developing great habits, how do you handle your uh, under pressure? You develop that right now. So I'm seeing what you can do. So when the bright lights come on, you're ready. And I think the, the guys coming through, and I've got, a, I've got a lot easier job than Adam. I've only got 11 contracted players. And I'll sit down with um, all of them at the start of the season, one-on-one. -on -one, we'll get out of the office, get out of the bus, go down and have a coffee, go and have lunch. And it's really to get to know how they want me to approach them. And one of the first things I asked, who was the best coach you ever had? Who was the best school teacher you ever had? Why was that? Or who was the worst coach and who, why was that? And so I'm getting to know how they want delivery. Um, so we had Sean Reddidge, and Sean Reddidge played 17, 18 years, number two on the all-time Wildcats. And first time I, I talked to him, it was, Sean, do, you, how do, do I talk to you in front of the group? Or you, do you want to do one-on-one? -on -one? It's like, let's do all one-on-ones. So he would get embarrassed if I called him out in front of the group, which is fine. But he wanted that one-on-one -on -one contact and, you know, we shut the door, we go through some stuff and bang, he'd come out, he'd be good. But if I went out there and said, Sean, that was terrible, you would let this guy, he would shrink into his little shell and it'd take another two or three weeks for him to come back out. And I think that's very important for any job that you have leadership or you're in front of people, just get to know them and how that delivery is different from player to player. Now, you just mentioned something about asking them who was their, their favorite coach or someone mm -hmm. they admired. Both of you, please. Who is a coach or a person that you admire vastly and 
aspire to be like or learned a lot from? Yeah, I don't have uh, a distinct... I was coached under Dennis Pagan, who's an, uh, anyone knows Dennis from back in the 90s, and he was the... Uh, you're, you're pretty soft today. <laughs> you, uh, you're not going hard enough, and I don't like those socks you're wearing. Uh, he would, he'd get personal. Are uh, you looking at my socks? No, I, I... no, I was talking about me. But he, he would um, he would question the colour of my hair, saying it's too red. Um, so there was there was uh, there was some moments with Dennis that um, I think he helped build resilience within within me. So I like I, I like that. Just get get to the point, and if you want to sledge me, that's great. Um, I don't mould myself on Dennis, but I reflect a lot on how he got, you know, we, we played in seven prelims in a row and, and three grand finals. There's a mobile phone going off. <laughs> so one of our players, you'd be a bit of strife. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we had a lot of success under Dennis. So how he managed the players and how he went about the intricacies of, of managing his staff, that I reflect on that, but I wouldn't say he's one I aspire to be like. I'm trying to take a little bit from all the coaches I worked under. And I think that's, that's the key for me. I've been exposed to some coaches in Australia, some top-line coaches, coaches in America, and it's taken little bits of what works for you. Um, I still remember as a kid, and I, maybe it was written in the stars, I coached, but I was only about 10, and in Warnable they used to have this big uh, annual Australia Day weekend tournament, and all the big teams would come back down to Warnable. It was uh, in summer, and it was a big deal. And Lindsay Gaze used to bring the Melbourne Tigers down. And Andrew's only 16 years old. And I could get right up close and look over, look over the boundary, uh, the fence to Lindsay Gaze. And back then, they didn't have uh, whiteboards. You know, you see all us now, whiteboards, it's, it's way too much. Lindsay used to use coins on the floor <laughs> and started moving two bob pieces all around. So I don't know if I was trying to look for if he left two bob down there <laughs> or I was trying to figure out what he was doing. But it was... Uh, so I've taken a little bit of that, a little bit from when I was in America, and I've taken a lot from AFL. I used to love sitting and just watching how Clarko and, and uh, Simo used to work with the boys. And they gave... One, for me, they gave a lot of ownership to the, to the players. And so as soon as I got here, I wanted to give the ownership not let them run the asylum, but a little bit of ownership for that. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be with Simo a couple of times, and he, he just has those guys eating out of the palm of his hand, just his communication skills of first class. So I want to take a little bit of that to keep improving and keep developing as a coach. Um, with everything that you both have talked about, it leads to individuals reflecting or looking up to be either players themselves or co maybe coaches in the future. Um, is there any bits of advice that you have for either developing players or developing coaches, which sometimes can be a path in itself, just moving forward? Uh, we're big on developing great uh, habits. So we're, we're now develop a work ethic, work ethic every time across the floor. And I like to get the young fellas and said, watch this guy over here. Just watch how he operates. And Sean Redditch was one of the most professional players that I've ever seen. He would come to work every single day. He would stay behind every single day and shoot an extra 200. And if he didn't feel wet, he'd shoot there a little bit more. And most of the guys now would just pick up their bag and go. And, there's a, and it's funny, I was down at the Storm a couple of uh, months ago and then the two players leaving the field was Cameron Smith and um, the fullback. What's the fullback? It's just yeah, oh, Billy Slater. Billy Slater. The last two. And I'm thinking, well, there's, no, there's a correspondence here, isn't it? The best players work on their skill and, and without any sport. So it's, it's more powerful if the player sees it than I tell him, hey, listen, you've got to do extra work. You see how these guys operate and play 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, look after their body and be prepared. We're the same. I mean, the only thing I suppose advice is if you've got passion to succeed in that in your field, you can be the hardest worker. You can't have an excuse for that. So I think talents. You know, sometimes you don't have the talent, but don't don't question your your work ethic. So we've got the same. And Matty Prittis was classic for us. We were really blessed to have him for for four years because I would just go to a new recruit. You just watch what he does, and then you'll be fine if you follow that. And so. That would be a great example for us, and um, they're, they're good habits amongst the club. But anyone even coaching the coaching sense, I mean, your pathway, uh, how many people would actually be willing to do what you did to get to where you are now? There's not many, and there's lots of people you think, yeah, I'd do that, but do you? Do you really want it that bad? It's, 
It's a little bit of how bad you want it, really. Okay. Well, I'm going to close our formal questions, but we want to give the audience an opportunity to ask uh, two or three questions with the minutes that we have remaining. Oh, right next to you. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for such an um, interesting and entertaining conversation. Uh, my question is, what benefits do your two teams gain from being sponsored and linked uh, to a university like Edith Cowan University? Yeah, that. <laughs> oh no, we're, no, we're good. We're, 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 um, we've got a great relationship. We, we use a lot of the uni students to help us with their analytics, and it doesn't come under the soft cap, so that's all good. Uh, we, we, we've got a good we, idea. Yeah, you should do it. Aren't you, aren't you doing it? What are you I doing, get mate? Under this. Who do so I see? We, um, we had uh, we had a photo shoot today with um, some of the some of the young uh, students who have been working at a club one day a week, and um, we give them some exposure and experience in our industry, and, and we get a lot out of that relationship. And there's so many other things that we do that we connect. I mean, doing these things, I've done five or six of these things, and they're good for me as well as sharing experiences. I get to talk to these great people, but uh, the practical part for us is we get a bit of opposition analytics done. So, for example, Max Gorn, we're playing him this week. We've got a ECU boy, uh, having a crack at uh, working out how he's going to be exposed. Can't find the answer yet, but the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the hit zones, okay, just mark his last five games, he's had 300 ruck contests, give me the algorithm, or the, not the algorithm, give me the um, analytics of where he's more than likely going to hit it. So 30% of the time he hits it here. When he hits it here, he actually stands in this position. So I can tell my mids, when he stands there, going to go there. So that's, that's these guys. So otherwise I get my coaches to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we also use them at training on occasions too. We've got some young um, you know, practice students as well who um, are, are, are train-ons. I don't know if you need train-ons. Um, so we might do a drill and we need um, flying Ryan to jump on someone. <laughs> we get the <laughs> practice student, just stand there. No, <laughs> we're, <laughs> put the big pad yeah, on. Put the pad on. <laughs> You'll be fine, mate. You'll be fine. I like it. Uh, that was, so we, 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 we've been cross-communicating and using each other quite well, and I think our strength and conditioning guys um, uh, have, have got in touch with these guys a, a hell of a lot to, um, because you guys set the standard with some of the things that we're looking into medically as well. What about you? I'm um, exactly what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Are we made to call Monday morning? Actually, yeah. Uh, Thanks so much. Trevor's going to be doing all of those things now, so the workload just doubled. Um, next question. Actually, where you were, and then I'll come down here and see where we are for time. Am I going, biasing guys? this um, side? Adam, I'm actually the president of the ECU Jets uh, Football Club. Um, we're entering our first final series on the weekend. Um, we, there's just like a, is there any advice you can give from a grassroots level, um, not when I get sponsored by ACU as much, but we wear the, we wear the uh, logo on our jumpers. Uh, is there a lack of motivation ever in the top level, same for you Trevor, uh, to keep the boys, you know, on task and, you know, just enjoying the game? Is there a, ever a lack of that up in the top level? Well, so you were about to hit finals, did you say? Yeah. It's funny, we've, we've spoken a couple of times about, um, uh, which is your, ex your experience, about trying to go back to back and how do you motivate the players to go back to the well. Um, I'm lucky enough to, with, with Alistair, um, one of the things, so every coach I've had at AFL level has a theme going into finals. Mm -hmm. And what that theme is, is up to the, to the coach, and, but there's something there that, that recalibrates the season. So right, that's done, we've qualified. It was, let's have a crack at this. So we've got four weeks of footy for us. What are you going to do about it? And one of the things that Alistair did, uh, it was about 50 days before the grand final. And there was a museum was getting refurbished at Hawthorne. And it, it just happened to be a um, trophy cabinet that get, got pulled through the uh, footy department. He said, oh, can I borrow that for a while? I said, yeah. So he just put that in the meeting room and put 50 on it. And then the next day, 49 the next day, 48. So grand final day, wheels it in before the game, and it's got zero. And then he's going, oh, here we go. So that's just a great little story, but um, you, you went through a similar experience. Yeah, well, uh, mine's not as graceful as that. I'd, <laughs> after um, 
we won the championship, then the next year, obviously I was, I was looking for something uh, to motivate the guys and use as a theme all the way through. And we, we since this year, we've, uh, since that year, we've always had a theme going through. And the guys really bite on it. Um, but the one I'll, I'll tell you is um, we're in pre-season and the movie Everest was just out of the cinemas. And I'm saying, yes, <laughs> you know, this is Everest, climb the mountain, you're going to struggle and this is, this is perfect. So... Got all the guys, you know, we've got the popcorn, they've got the drinks. I'm just, this is going to be the best coaching session oh, ever. <laughs> Halfway through the movie, they started dying. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> so anyway, so they went through. So they're ripping me the next day. And I said, well, what, all right, did you get anything out of it at all? Uh, you know, it's, it's not. And one of the guys said, don't leave no one alone. Don't leave no one alone. I said, wow. How good is that? So we used Everest and used it up, but if you were doing something, you're not going to do it alone. So that everyone was going to support you. We weren't going to leave you on the side of the mountain to die. We are going to take you with you and you're coming with us. So it was a funny thing that it worked out, but uh, we finished up winning the championship, so I'll take that. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <It's coaching. laughs> all right. With that, apologies. I think we're going to end the questions there because that is a a good story to read the cheat on the movie before you yeah, send your team to the movie. And um, we're just going to um, close this event. So before I do that, I'd just like to thank our fantastic speakers, both Adam Simpson and Trevor Gleason.